In this video, we're going to learn how to auscultate or listen to heart sounds. Also, we'll investigate electrocardiograms, sometimes called ECGs or EKGs. I chose this picture because this woman's just ridiculously excited to have her heart listened to. This is what an EKG looks like. This is a familiar pattern. You've probably seen it on movies and stuff. And this man here is, um, we have leads hooked up to him and he's going to um, have an electrocardiogram. So we'll look at heartbeats, heart sounds, and EKGs. First, heart sounds. This is a mnemonic device which is helpful. Apartment M2245, or just Apartment 2245. So when you're listening for heart sounds, there's four places you want to listen. This is the A, P, T, M of apartment. And 2245 refers to the intercostal spaces. So if we count the ribs, one, two. This is the intercostal space, the second intercostal space. So this is two, two, four, and five. That's where we get two, two, four, five. So at the second intercostal space, we can listen for the aortic valve. At the second intercostal space on the other side, we can listen for the pulmonic valve. And then also on the left side, but at the fourth intercostal space, we can listen for the closing of the tricuspid valve. And then the fifth intercostal space, um, sort of at the clavicular midline, um, some animations will show it more underneath the nipple. So somewhere around here, uh, we can listen to the mitral valve close. Now you might be thinking, well, these positions don't show the locations of the valve, and you'd be correct. Um, these are not where the valves are positioned in the heart. This is where we auscultate, or this is where we listen for the sounds of the heart. A heart murmur, that's a whooshing sound that's caused by turbulent blood flow. Oftentimes that's from the backflow or regurgitation of blood through valves. So instead of blood going one way through the valves, blood leaks back and it goes the other way. And that makes distinctive sounds. Like a heartbeat, it makes a blood dog sound. The first heart sound, lob, also known as S1, is caused by the closing of the AV valves after the atria have pumped blood into the ventricles. The second heart sound, dub, or S2, originates from the closing of the aortic and pulmonary valves right after the ventricles have ejected the blood. The time interval between S1 and S2 is when the ventricles contract, called systole. The interval between S2 and the next S1 is when the ventricles relax and are filled with blood, called diastole. Diastole is longer than systole, hence the lub-dub, lub-dub, lub-dub. Heart sounds are auscultated at four different sites on the chest wall, which correspond to the location of blood flow as it passes through the aortic, pulmonic, tricuspid, and mitral valves, respectively. This is how similar defects associated with different valves are differentiated. Heart murmurs or whooshing sounds produced by turbulent flow of blood. Murmurs are diagnosed based on the time they occur in the cardiac cycle, their changes in intensity over time, and the auscultation site where they are best heard. Examples of conditions associated with common systolic murmurs include Mitral valve regurgitation, when the mitral valve does not close properly and blood surges back to the left atrium during systole. The murmur starts at S1 when the AV valves close and maintains the same intensity for the entire duration of systole. The video goes on and shows multiple other heart murmurs, but I thought one was sufficient. So remember, apartment M2245 tells you at what intercostal space to listen, and you listen for the aortic, pulmonic, tricuspid, and mitral. All right, now let's look at some EKGs. The electrocardiogram, or ECG, is a recording of the heart's electrical activity via leads placed at standardized points on the subject's body. This animation shows how the different ECG waves are produced during a cardiac cycle.
The P wave is produced as the electrical impulse travels through the atria, causing them to contract. The P wave corresponds to atrial depolarization. The impulse then travels through the atrioventricular node, producing a flat section on the ECG, known as the PR segment. The PR segment is flat because no current is flowing through the cardiac muscle cells. As the impulse travels from the AV node to the bundle of Hiss and along the upper part of the septum, the Q wave is produced. The passage of the electrical signal through the ventricles produces a large spike called the QRS complex. The QRS complex is much larger than the P wave because the ventricles are much larger than the atria and so produce more electrical activity. Most of the QRS complex represents depolarization of the left ventricle, which has much greater mass than the right. The impulse remains unchanged for a moment as the ventricles remain depolarized. This gives rise to another flat section called the ST segment. As the impulse fades away and the ventricles repolarize, the T wave is formed. Note, this animation shows the ECG recorded from a lead placed at position V6, one of the standard electrode positions to the left of the heart. Leads at other positions detect the electrical activity of the heart from a different point of view and therefore produce differently shaped ECGs. As you will see, during atrial fibrillation, the electrical activity of the atria becomes disorganized. As a result, there is no P wave on the ECG of a patient in atrial fibrillation. The absence of P waves is one of the most important features used to diagnose atrial fibrillation. An ECG can be intimidating, but let's try to distill it down to the basics. So it's a recording of the electrical events of the heart. And notice it's the sum of all the electrical events, or the sum of the action potentials, or the sum of the impulses. So the electrical activity of the heart is strong enough that it can be measured on the skin. So the electrodes that are placed on the skin measure those electrical potential differences. So let's zoom in on one of these waves here. If we do that, we see the P wave. Remember, the P wave is associated with the depolarization of the atria. And when that happens, that leads to atrial systole or contraction of the atria. So this is the P wave. And then next, this is the QRS complex. And that's the depolarization of the ventricles. And that leads to ventricular systole or ventricular contraction. And then we have the T wave. What the T wave is, that's the repolarization of the ventricles. The reason why we don't see the repolarization of the atria is because it gets obscured in the QRS complex. So the P wave is a depolarization of the atria. The QRS complex is the depolarization of the ventricle. And the T wave is the repolarization of the ventricles. Now in the video, they mentioned atrial fibrillation. That's irregular and rapid heart rate when the atria experience chaotic electrical signals. So let's look at that. This is normal. And then over here, this is the sort of the fibrillations, the back and forth erratic pattern. So normal pattern, atria, ventricle. And then here we have a lot going on in the atria and then some electrical activity in the ventricle too. But this is the normal rhythm that's produced. And here, here's the erratic one. See how there's really no P wave? There's just sort of like gibberish and lines in there. Also, the ventricular contractions are irregular. So atrial fibrillation is an example of a heart arrhythmia. That's a word you need to know, an arrhythmia. That's an irregular um, EKG or irregular heart pattern. And if someone, that, if someone has atrial fibrillation, um, that puts them at a five to seven times higher risk for stroke than the general population. Here it is again. Here's an EKG of normal rhythm. Notice that the QRS complex is at regular intervals. But then the QRS complex and someone with atrial fibrillation is very erratic. And again, notice the absence of P waves. It's just sort of inscrutable markings up and down. So this is normal EKG and this is atrial fibrillation.